May that one protect us both, may that one nourish us both. May we work together with great energy and vigor. May our studies be illumined. May we not unnecessarily cavil with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Om Sangha Chaddam Samvada Dham Samve Manansi Janatam Deva Bhagam Yata Purve Samjanana Upasati May we walk together, march forward with a common goal. May we be open-minded. May we work together in harmony. May we share our thoughts for integrated wisdom. And may we follow the example of our ancestors who achieved higher goals by virtue of being united. All right, so, uh, so okay, we have a question before us then. And uh, let me see if I understand it correctly. Anyway, it is about thought. Uh, first of all, we have to understand a principle that there's nothing more powerful, more potent than thought. Thought adds instantaneously, first of all, locally, and then everywhere else. And uh, then we have to understand how this principle works. And that means I have to repeat the principles of the mechanism of how that works. So the first mistake that we make is to say that we have an individual mind. It's not true. We may have a, a local transistor that picks up a general broadcast. So now we can imagine a broadcast broadcasting to everywhere and it doesn't require a messenger to go to somebody's house to deliver, here's the broadcast. And the next door, did you receive the broadcast? All right, here's a backup. The minute the person starts speaking, as I'm doing now, you're receiving it. Why would we take away the individual mind or the sense of individual mind and replace it with a universal mind it's on a number of very sound basic principles that the greatest generalization and the more subtle will be the most truthful. And we're always looking for a unity behind a generalization. And we know, even from comparatively modern science, that everything is made of energy. This was established way, way back in the 1920s already when uh, general relativity came in. Anyway, the long and the short of it is that energy or potential energy is really what is there. Because it's more subtle, it's more causal. Now, if we look at what we understand to be energy in Sanskrit terms, well, let's replace it by the yogic concept of prana, prana energy. And the subtlest of those energies would be psychic energy. What, otherwise, what we understand is thought. Swami Vivekananda's Raja Yoga is well worth studying on this point. When he deals with very uh, comprehensively that the subject of prana, subject of pranayama, I should say, subject of psychic prana and so on, all of that is there. It's worth reading uh, something from his book. He says, uh, that part, 
uh, of pranayama that means the control of thought or control of prana energy mm -hmm. which attempts to control the physical manifestations of the prana by physical means is called physical science and that part which tries to control the manifestations of the prana as mental force by mental uh, means this is called raja yoga that means the control of your own mind the control of your own thought the control of the energy that manifests itself as fleeting glimpses through the mind that comes as impressions and when those impressions are habitual then it sits in a deposit bank account called the subconscious mind and so it's the subconscious mind that has a drawing power it has an attractive power it draws things in toward itself now in god's area there's no subconscious there's only conscious mind now of course we have many many examples of how this works on the physical level the interaction between mind and matter matter simply being subtle mind and mind being uh, so matter simply being gross mind and mind being subtle matter and Swami Vivekananda puts this out right up front in his Raja Yoga. So when we talk of mind as an outer, a, an extra material thing or extra physical thing, it's not quite correct in the sense that you see, has anybody measured the mind or your mind, my mind, where my mind begins, your mind ends? We have no idea about this. When you think of something, there's no physical manifestation of it, obvious to anybody else, and maybe not even to yourself. If you think about depressing thoughts, second after second, and don't control this, then you will end up in a state of depression and attract that negativity toward you. So yes, supposing you decide that you are quite happy with the condition of poverty, then poverty will be what you get. Whatever you want, whatever your subconscious or habitual state is that you'll get, it acts as a kind of magnet, pulling things in toward you, because the mind is basically, at the cosmic level, a creative entity. It creates what you want. So my will be done, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven means let us align our individual will devoid of egoism and align it to a cosmic will that we call cosmic mind. This cosmic mind creates everything, the whole material universe. All the subtle elements are born from it. And the combination of these subtle elements arrives on your doorstep as your life in summary comprising of your body and you can imagine a kind of sphere that contains your body other people's bodies and then all kinds of events and so on and so forth uh, that surround you and so florence scovelshin mentions this if you hate, you'll be hated. If you love, you'll be loved. We have a great desire to love. Well, the problem with that is it's bracketed by a version of un I'm unloved. I don't get it at the moment. I want to be loved means I wish there was a flow, it means it's not here, not arrived as yet. No. Florence Scovel Shin in her book, Game of Life and How to Play It, says that this law, which she describes as giving and receiving or sowing and reaping, is a causal law, there's no doubt. But we have to understand, in order to master it, we have to understand that this game of life called giving and receiving is based on spiritual law. That's what she says up front. So I'll just remind you, you see, it's a beautifully written book with so many examples in it. See, most people consider life a battle, she starts, but it's not a battle, it's a game. Right away, we have to change our thinking. And that means we have to have a philosophy behind it, which incorporates a certain element of spiritual law, 
which says that there's only one reason why this life should exist, and that is it is a state of different waves going back and forth. These waves are called tanmatras. It's a play of waves. As soon as we understand that, and there's a, there's a, uh, it's made clearly in the uh, Vakra uh, Samhita, it's called. There it says very clearly, you see. If you understand these subtle elements behind the gross elements, you can imagine them behind that. Those that produces all sounds and all ears as well. There being no difference, it's just a combination and subtlety in the expression of waves. If we view it like that, that's one thing. But where do these waves come from? They are divine waves. These are waves comprising grace, divine grace flowing, flowing towards us, flowing everywhere. God's angels, if you will making the crooked path straight for us, going ahead in advance. If that's the case, then we're in command of these. This was understood by the ancient rishis. You see, if we go back to ancient, the ancient history of religion and religious practice itself and concepts, we are just amazed at all the forces around us. Not having any science behind us, we simply look at clouds passing we understand that so those clouds accumulate. We understand that wind, what wind is in terms of our experience of it. We've observed it. We've seen what it can do. We've seen that it can provide us with a pleasant breeze or destroy us completely and knock a whole tree down. We see how the marvel of lightning in the sky, a flash goes off. We have no understanding about the friction that causes electricity in the clouds and the molecules crashing together creating this we have no understanding of that so it's a beautiful thing to look at and you know it's accompanied by this great voice in the sky called thunder so it's natural to separate all these forces individually and think that they are all individual powerful entities and there must be something and someone in command of one and someone in command of the other and not only in command but there must be these forces must be the very embodiment of that it's not necessarily a separation of a commander it must be intrinsically part and parcel entered into it you are lightning you are fire you are thunder you are the clouds you are the dawn you are this you are that and so some mantras then get created in terms of enormous feeling of praise wonder adoration, thankfulness. Wherever I look, I see these things. And I see the coordination of that creates an abundance, which I call food. And I am naturally inclined to make sure that it keeps going. So naturally, I'll create a fire, the most sacred object that I can think of, because it is the most ancient discovery. Its discovery led to a complete change in diet which means we have more leisure to think. We don't have to spend so much time hunting and gathering to get food. The easier it is uh, to digest food, and uh, the, the more strength we get from it, the better. And we can also preserve that food as well, cook it and, at our leisure, uh, as it were. We have that leisure to gaze into the fire and get inspiring ideas wait shuffle ideas around not knowing that it's this cosmic mind that's supplying all these ideas so mantras are created in praise very soon these sages realize oh wait these natural forces i can control because a mantra is a powerful thought accompanied by an action recitation a making waves um, and if all things are waves then all i have to do is control the waves and then of course the idea occurs i'm not the waves i'm not the mind i'm none of this something separate from it what a wonderful revelations just gained from concentration and analysis which says let me analyze this 
external world as modern science is doing today and see how it works, why it works. Let me find something that is existent. Now, existence is a wonderful term in philosophy. It's a, it's a term that expresses a different kinds of ontology. Ontology is that aspect which inquires the nature of existence itself and being. In a recent discussion with somebody who was a materialist, atheistic materialist, actually, uh, I was saying, well, give me an example of existence. His idea is, if there is a God that stands outside space and time, then this God can be, must be non-existent, since the only thing we know is space and time. What is existence according to his definition? Existence is a location of something with an, in, with an extension on it, you can say in time. Yes, but if you take time and space away, what do you find there? This question also arises, by the way, in the Katu Upanishad that I often quote, because it asks that same question, Nachiketa is asking, Reality, so reality is unborn, unchanging. But before we come to that conclusion, we have to say that apart from time, that is apart from the past and the future. I'm always keen to bring some science into this. You see from Einstein, his general relativity, actually his special relativity, he says, well, time is not fixed. You think this present is the reality, is the existence. But I can tell you the past and the future are equally true, equally valid. There's no difference. It depends where you're standing from. And we know that there's such a thing as time dilation. Time is no longer really a, a, a measurement separate from everything else. It's not that it's standard for everyone. It's not according to all clocks are the same. No, clocks are different. And furthermore, when you add time as a dimension to space, space has three dimensions, you make a fourth dimension. You don't measure times, uh, time, you don't measure things in terms of distance. So, I'll give you an example. Supposing I want to go up to Dungannon. If I look on the map, I can draw a straight line from my location to Dungannon. But that's not the whole story. The story is much more complicated than that. If I draw a straight line, it takes so many kilometers. But if I now plot my journey and say, well, I have to go up this way and the, the road winds this way and that way, not only that, I have to make a turning somewhere. And then I have to go through a town and then I have to take another turning. And, and that's some total is really this, uh, this uh, uh, time-space continuum. That's the whole thing. And now, the interesting thing about that is, if I make it longer, that is, if I make all the winding roads and so on and so forth, the time taken becomes shorter, according to Einstein. The sense of time goes shorter because I'm going faster. In order to extend this time, I have to go faster. And when I go faster, according to Einstein, then time starts, uh, starts slowing down, I should say, starts slowing down. So when the time starts slowing down, if you want the formula for aging or taking away aging, there it is. Try, try to travel at the speed of light, and you will uh, reduce your years. If you want to go round in a circle, then the theory is that time slows down, aging will also slow. But if you want to spend your time like that, and of course the effects will be minimal, well then all you'll do is probably get dizzy. But you see, if you a question is asked, tell me that, which you see as different from virtue and vice, different from cause and effect, and different from past and future. 
So apart from the past and the future, that is the concept of time, the question is, what is there that remains? God remains. That's all that remains. Only God remains. If we take the causal connection of time off, then seen through time, God looks as if he is evolving from a lower state to a higher state. That's what we call a universe. So to register all of this properly, we have to register it to God's account. Everything is him and it's all coming from the cosmic mind. And every thought we have will be a creative thought. That creative thought invariably will mobilize these deities. So just as mantras and putting certain sacrificial elements into the fire was a movement, a mental movement taking place, thoroughly, dramatically endorsed with a physical ritual, enforced, underlined, then what would be the result of it? We don't have to pray to these gods anymore, these gods of the wind and the earth and this and that and the other. No. Instead of praising them, or instead of praising them and begging from them that your life will be good, you take the begging prayer away and you put in a commanding thought, commanding prayer, that thy will be done, as long as thy will be done, then all things will work out according to that will, according to the law of harmony, according to the law of um, uh, uh, of peace and all the other qualities and attributes that we would desire. Put the thought in. Then in short, what is that game of life? Game of life is noticing and assessing when a negative comes. And at that moment, fill up with so many positives. Don't wait for the negative to come in. Do it anyway. That's the technique. Now, what will happen when we do that? We'll attract something corresponding toward ourselves. If we try to do it deliberately, it won't work. Because if we do it deliberately, we're having so much doubt contained within it. A lack of faith. It's like saying, okay, so let me, uh, uh, let me, uh, and do some uh, gardening one day, you know. And then the next day, nothing happens. Yeah, one day it'll happen. One day it'll happen. One day it'll happen. It means the original thought was, let me do some gardening at some point in time. Not now, not today. So I have to be very careful with my language because all my concepts and all my words, they words frame the concepts, are all thought movements, and they become attractive forces. Now, is it always like that? No. There are other factors involved. So, for example, I see in the news today, there was something like an earthquake that displaced about 170 people in France. And it's an unusual occurrence, but there it is. So, is it your thought that caused it? Not at all. These are what insurance companies call act of God, nature. There is a cause. Everything has a cause. What is the cause of such a thing? Well, the cause is that this earth is a physical thing, a, a physical blue globe. And underneath the blueness, the sea, there'll be all kinds of fishes and the, their shifting crust and so on that the Earth's inner skin is a shifting landscape, if you will. We don't notice it normally. So there are certain laws of nature which just happen to be there. And nature doesn't run on perfection. Nature runs on asymmetry and imperfection. Accept it and take it as part of our challenge or part of our game. So there's that component. Then another component will be other people's actions. Other people's actions also are there. But as far as we are concerned, we can only control two things. We can control only the things which are close to us. And that means we can control the body and we can control the mind. 
And when we can draw body and mind together, it becomes a useful instrument that can be aligned to divine will. But you see, naturally, and what Scoville Shin is pointing out, naturally every thought will condense. Every thought, absolutely sacred law. It's a law of sowing and reaping. Whatever we sow in terms of our thought, we will reap. That's an absolute surety. And the, the, uh, the trend of that will be contained in the habitual mind, which acts as a kind of suction, drawing things in toward us. So this works even if on any basis. You see, there are many people who want to assert, we want to get away from money. Money is evil. Who said money is evil? Money is just something. It's just an object. It's a means. It's a means to an end. So do you want more of it? Yes. Why? Well, I want to build an orphanage. Well, that's good. Then money will come to you. But what does it depend on? It depends on a faith in the, in the beginning, which says, I have the capacity to think without doubting because this is divine thought, this divine grace flowing in me, and I can then mold it as I want because the cosmic mind is infallible. And I can do this for good or ill. I can desire money in order to build an orphanage and do God's work, say. Or I can desire money in order to heighten my physical pleasures. Well, the one will damage me. The other one may elevate the mind if I take it in the right way. So everything that is behind the physical is comprised of thought. That's the fact of it. And so you can have all your examples of your own. And if you look back in the past, you'll see how true it is as well. Whatever condition we were in, this thought comes out as desire, of course. And we, there are, of course, two types of desire. A desire which wants something centered around myself. And the other kind of desire is centered around freedom from myself. It is freedom from my sense of individuality. One is positive, one is ultimately negative. And sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between positive and negative. We have to have that capacity to do so. It's all scripture based. So we can't see the totality. Things look as if they're evolving and changing. And yet when we see the totality, then every thought movement will condense as a positive. Now, there are popular writers uh, after Scoville Shin, which we were discussing, positive writers, Napoleon Hill, for example, is one of them, and uh, uh, so many of them were there. And they all picked up on this principle of positive thinking. What they didn't insert was, it's a divine arrangement, and Scoville Shin has it. It's a divine arrangement. A spiritual law is necessary. An understanding of spiritual law is necessary. If we go on with just her introduction, which is probably one of the most valuable parts of the book. So it's a game, however, which cannot be played successfully without the knowledge of spiritual law. Just straight away. And then the Old and New Testaments give rules of the game with wonderful clearness. Jesus Christ taught that it was a game of giving and receiving. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And this means that whatever a person sends out in word or deed will return to him. And what he gives, he will receive. You can draw a line under that. That's a final conclusion. That's an axiom. So she goes on. Yes, if he gives hate, he will receive hate. Love, you receive love. Now, there's a version of the book that I have that is twice as long as the original book. 
because being aware of political correctness. The second part of the book is exactly the same as the first part, except instead of saying he, it says she. It puts everything in the feminine. So we can see either one, if he or she hates, gives hate, then he or she will receive hate, and so it goes on. Whatever, here's the important thing, whatever a man and woman, let's say, images, sooner or later, externalize in his affairs. Finished? Whatever, that's the law. And then she goes on giving some examples. That means, you see, we have to neutralize the most severe obstacle we have, which is fear, and doubt is a kind of version of it as well. And the antidote is faith. Absolutely faith, absolute faith and trust that uh, this law works. That's the first thing. And that we have the capacity to mobilize it and image making, the means that uh, what man imagines, the, the sooner or later externalizes in his fear. This is the means toward it, imagining. And imagination evokes feeling as well. Now it's the same in every sphere of life that you can think of. And uh, so it's, it's uh, if you, whether it's for good or ill, that's okay. So if you desire wealth, don't go from the position of poverty. Assume that you have it already. And then visualize it, you'll get it. Our problem is, of course, we can do that for a few seconds and neutralize it for a few seconds and won't go anywhere. And then neutralize that even more, not just neutralize it, but saturate it to negativity by asserting, no, it's not possible. I doubt it. It's never happened before. It seems too good to be true. It just seems unreal. So we have to be very, very clear of what we mean by these terms existence and so on. Now I come back to my friend. He's saying, okay, so existence must be within this framework of time and space. And since uh, there's nothing else than that, then uh, this, uh, this existence cannot come from anything. If there's a God, and it's outside of space and time, God is non-existent. That's the argument. But you see, the idealists will have a different idea of what existence is, and the really deeper thinker will say, existence is the thing that always exists constantly. It never changes. It doesn't change in terms of time and space. For that reason, it must be different from time and space then what to talk about all these other things within the realm and framework of time and space? Well, we would classify this as Vedantas in the category of unreal. But it's tangibly real to us. And even when we dream, it seems real to us. So how can you say this is unreality? Well, it is only relatively real. It's only relative to the instruments that catch it and pick it up. That's all. But something that appears and disappears, we can't say it's real. So this is the ontological argument of being versus becoming. And just to remind you of the schema of things, it starts off with an absolute pure being and then taking on the framework the kind of web of time and space, it becomes potentially creative and then creative. And then all the different angels and waves, if you will, of creation will all do their job. The Ashtavakra Gita will tell us, once we've discovered these subtle elements, then freedom is ours immediately. The minute we take it seriously and break it down and operate as a fragment within the world of fragments, then we'll get fragmented results for ourselves. It'll be incomplete 
And this incompletion will be a sense of lack of perfection, lack of wholeness. So that's, that's what we have. So uh, I hope that that's as clear as mud to everybody. <laughs> Swamiji, yes, I am. I have another question, I think. Um, the divine play and the spiritual law in asking for what is rightfully yours under the spiritual law, can you apply that to, or what's the situation if there is someone that I know you can't change someone else, it's up to them, but someone that you're have deep concerns about and if you say look it is as it is and i cast my burden onto god to deal with it um so that in itself if you have faith and you believe that that should stop the worry um, but and obviously if you believe it it will help the other person is that right well we we have to shift our outlook you see if some if we see somebody and we wish they would change or we wish they could help we, we could help them we are framing this person in this realm of space and time as an individual as a human body and so on and so forth this is a, an independent person and that means that i'm also an independent person that's not a bad starting point because we have to deal with things as humans humanly speaking but it's not the final conclusion we have to if we really want to solve the problem any problem has to be solved at the most fundamental causal level the most fundamental causal level is god <laughs> we have to get used to that idea in which case there's nothing to be changed because that is full and free and perfect already nothing to be changed and then by itself you see that perfection flows through and change happens by itself without our demanding it or wishing it or want or doing anything about it we have to get used to the idea that it's like there is a one you know that you see we have to get used to the idea that god what we call god and by god we don't mean extra cosmic god by God, we mean that divine principle responsible for the rhythm and harmony within the universe and the creativity that we have. And that one, it's only one, appears just like many, refract, uh, many things refracted into nature. So uh, whatever we see, we see as fragments, including a whole chunk of a, a fragment called a person. <laughs> But even that person will have so many individual parts, physical parts, mental parts, and so on and so forth. And so we have to understand that that one God appears like many refracted into nature, human spirits and an inferred God. That has to be there. It's like uh, the one beam or homogeneous flow of light refracted in different wavelengths that we pick up through what we call spectro spectroscopy. So all the rainbow colors is really one white light that is split up in this, and there are things we can't see, the infrared, the ultraviolet, and so on. But it is all one thing, it's all one light. And as long as there, there is a, something that can fragment it, something like a prism, or water droplets or whatever it is acting like that that uh, are responsible for fr um, fracturing or, or or refracting or limiting our observation then actually we are helpless we are forced to see the non-evolving god as an evolving universe unless we are able to shift our position and that means that we have human beings that are born, that are evolving, that are dying, and probably reincarnating somewhere also. Though it's a, a distorted vision, 
really no such thing is happening. This is the idea we have to get used to. As long as the prism of the mind is there, we're forced to see this evolution. And when the entity, the mind disappears, because the mind is the fragmenter, in let's say a deep sleep, dreamless sleep, then we don't see any evolution. As soon as you take the mind out, the fragments go. So we have to make sure that uh, we're perfectly all right, of course, in a dreamless sleep. And we're perfectly all right in that stage of memory as well, uh, of, of uh, meditation as well, where we get that same experience, the detachment from the mind itself, using the mind initially and then letting, letting it go. It's like uh, your car pushing it, pushing it until it goes by itself. In the, in the old days, you know, they didn't have the starter at all. They had this, a big handle on the front. You, <laughs> you wound it up like this, you know, and then it started and that's fine. It, you had to always do that externally, you always had to do that. I'm out of an age where I, where I uh, have seen that, you know, as a common thing, you know, to start the car, you know, wind it up, you know. Or an airplane where you have to wind up, we have to uh, rotate, rotate the impeller before it suddenly kicks off and takes off. So we have to do that. We have to take the initial thing, which we have, and then let it run by itself. You take the initial steps, then let it run by itself. Initial steps, somebody's in trouble, offer your compassion, offer your love, of your support and so on and so forth. Listen patiently. But all the time you're thinking, oh, this all to do with the fragments. Lord, you're there sitting behind. You're not in trouble. You have put on a number of multiple masks for me with one purpose in mind so that I can recognize you and adore you. Adoration. Soon as that adoration is there, the Lord will peep out from behind and say, oh yes, okay, I'm discovered. Next example, please. Difficult situation. Oh, it's so difficult. My life is a mess. Ah, but you're the only existence. You're behind all these waves. You appear as many waves. You give me a mind to make sure I see it like that. Never mind, let me see there. Now, when you say see, it means imagine. But we're imagining all these things anyway. And we, by this imagination, this image making, we're evoking this totality that is, sits behind and that flows through. This is how Jesus dealt with it, you see. The blind man sees, the lame man walks, the dead man awakes. Why? He wasn't seeing it like we see it. You're standing there in the cosmic mind, blessing, with the realization, oh Lord, you are there. I don't see that the Lord is hopping around with one leg. How will the Lord manage with one leg, poor thing? I was healed, God. That would be absurd. It's only the manifested waves that are looking like this. As soon as I catch the actor out, ah, Lord, you are there, recognizing that, then all those waves change and manifest as, oh, the lame man walks, the blind man sees, the dead man awakes. So it's our perception which we have to adjust. There's no defective anything there. It's only a series of divine waves flowing. Rehearse that thousand, thousand, million, 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 billion, billion times until you get it. And your whole life gets transformed and all your conditions get, get transformed with it. So the whole of life becomes a challenge for us to recognize the unity of existence everywhere behind everything.
First impression, you take. Second impression, series of waves. Third thing, cosmic mind. Lord, you're there. One, two, three steps with everything. A three-step dance, a three-step waltz. You come to me, you feel so miserable, life is difficult, etc., etc. Yes, yes, what a pity, what a pity. Oh my, internally you're saying, what a glory, what a glory. Lord, you are there. You come disguised in this way. As soon as I think like that and introduce a sense of wonder, adoration, thankfulness also, though all the waves change. As soon as I repeat my mantra with deep feeling and connectedness, all the waves change. Thank you. Yeah. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be on God. Thank you, Swami. Thank you, Swami. Okay. Thank you, Swami. Thank you. Oh.